So the way to protect yourself best is to stay ahead, to build the industry, to set the standards, to make the infrastructure. And that's why I like this. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not the competition that we had with the Soviet Union. I mean, you have some people saying it's a new Cold War. It's not. But what you've got is an effort to put American industry in the dominant position when it comes to building the new digital infrastructure that we use AI. Uh, James Martin here. Let me quickly uh, jump in with a question. I mean, we've talked about and used this word dominant several times, right? The way I like to think about this new AI blueprint is it's a pretty significant pivot, if not reversal, from what we've seen in previous administrations, certainly uh, the Biden administration, right, which is all about denying China. Now we've gone from deny to trying to uh, dominate or trying to continue to dominate. I, I, I get that, right? But this whole idea of keeping them addicted to the U.S. stack and U.S. products, including H20 chips, et cetera, isn't that going to just make it easier for them to get to parity uh, and, and to do that faster as well? Because, you know, even if the H20 is not, uh, you know, the best ship that we've got, doesn't have all the bells and whistles, et cetera, uh, you know, th these guys are experts at reverse engineering, and, you know, uh, sooner or later they're going to figure it out. The Chinese have put a lot of effort into trying to reverse engineer chips. At one point, they were even using saws to cut them in half so they could see what it looked like under a microscope. Didn't work. I'm not so worried about reverse engineering. Where you've got a problem is China's essentially a peer. Think of all the places they live in now, like uh, EVs, uh, hypersonic missiles, uh, robotics. China's a peer competitor, and I think this is why you hear the word dominance. There's a little bit of anxiety there. But a lot of the effort here is to say the U.S. has the lead. We need to encourage the innovation processes, the industries that gave us that lead, and make sure they stay strong. So it's, it's a different kind of race, and that's actually a very positive. I give credit to people like Kratzios, the science advisor, Sachs, who you had on the show. Um, they realized that we're in a different kind of ballgame. Yeah, and how significant is it? I mean, uh, this isn't so much a whole-of-government effort, right, uh, to make America the AI capital of the world. What's more significant, and you mentioned David Sachs, I mean, uh, this is, uh, uh, he's one of the, 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 the main Hill and Valley guys, right? This is D.C. plus Silicon Valley plus big tech getting together. That's something we haven't seen for, for quite a while. Yeah, it's rather strange. And so that's been a problem. And the, the divorce between Silicon Valley and Washington is something that's been around for a decade. You saw Ash Carter when he was Secretary of Defense saying, we need to reconnect Washington and Silicon Valley. I think this administration, for better, for worse, takes that really seriously. And in some ways, I'm not sure who it is. I think it might be the people I mentioned, but someone there has figured out this is a different kind of industrialization. This is a different kind of global competition. And so they're doing the steps here. Two out of the, the, the action plan is good. What's important is the three executive orders that accompany it, because those are the things that will compel action. And two out of the three are good. Building workforce, building uh, manufacturing capabilities, um, selling to the world. Uh, we don't have a lot of competitors now. One thing we've learned in the past is if you don't sell, people will build. We've done this in satellites. We've done this in computers. We've done this in UAVs. The U.S. starts with the lead, announces we're not going to sell. Everyone else builds their own. So this executive order is in some ways an effort to kind of stay ahead of the, get, of the pack. And that's where it's got some benefit. NVIDIA hit a fresh intraday high Friday edging up 0.5% to $174.53 saws in early trading, on track to close at a record if it holds. The GPU pioneer gained momentum after a 1.7% surge Thursday, as investors brace for a tsunami of tech earnings next week. Expectations are still high on Wall Street, which views NVIDIA chips as the preferred choice for training AI models. By increasing its 2025 capital expenditure forecast by 13% to $85 billion, Alphabet demonstrated that demand and hinted at additional server and data center builds, including those involving NVIDIA's equipment. Even while Google promotes its own TPUs, it nevertheless supports GPUs to satisfy more general cloud requirements. According to Ben Reitzis of Melius Research, Google Cloud is currently limited in capacity, but expects to grow in the second half as a result of Google's ability to deploy additional capacity. 
a long-term market for NVIDIA sales and other conglomerates like AMD that could support an AI-driven GPU demand would be fueled by such a dynamic. As key NVIDIA reports are still ahead, its stocks might stay turbulent, but the rise in AI infrastructure does not appear to have hit its maximum. Last quarter, NVIDIA's pricing jumped 56%, in part due to its strategic inclusion in the NVIDIA Inception program and its availability on the AWS marketplace. Major indexes such as the S&P 500 and NASDAQ Composite have reached new highs, indicating that these developments are consistent with the overall upward momentum of the tech market. NVIDIA's partnerships with companies like TechSoft 3D and OpenAI, as well as developments in AI infrastructure, also sparked investor interest. The company's impressive success against a strong market environment was further supported by these reasons, as IT stocks continue to draw in investors. Recent changes, such as NVIDIA's inclusion in the NVIDIA Inception program and its accessibility on the AWS marketplace, may increase its appeal in the cloud and AI industries and boost sales and profits. NVIDIA's stock has returned a staggering 1,542.29% over the last five years. This significant increase stands in contrast to the U.S. market's overall 18% gain over the previous 12 months. Furthermore, NVIDIA's strong market position was demonstrated by the fact that its one-year return beat that of the U.S. semiconductor industry. The alliances with Uber and Toyota are expected to increase NVIDIA's market share in the automotive AI space and open up new income opportunities. Analysts predict that over the next three years, sales will expand at an annual pace of 26.2%, but these partnerships may help to boost those projections. While a significant portion of Tesla's future depends on the autonomous vehicle narrative, I see another opportunity quietly winning in the background. Autonomous vehicles represent a critical chapter in the broader artificial intelligence, AI, narrative. Unlike chatbots or recommendation algorithms, autonomous vehicles portray a confluence of more nuanced, sophisticated protocols, sensory processing, smart control systems, and dynamic logic converging into a single platform. As of today's share price of a 173.74, the proximity to the consensus price target of U179.55 indicates a slight upward potential, indicating that NVIDIA's current valuation could closely resemble analyst expectations. So what implications does this have for NVIDIA's stock? Let's explore that. But first, a big thank you to those of you who've stuck with us this far. Creating these videos takes significant effort and dedication. So if you're enjoying the content, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share your thoughts on NVIDIA stock in the comments. Your support truly helps us grow. Now, let's get back to the video. The emergence of self-driving cars essentially signifies a move away from reactive technologies with particular, sometimes constrained uses toward fully functional, intelligent robotic systems that are integrated with the real world. In my opinion, NVIDIA is the company with the most potential in the field of autonomous vehicle technology development, even though Tesla and Alphabet's Waymo get the most attention. Let's explore how NVIDIA is quietly playing a role in the autonomous driving landscape and detail just how big of an opportunity this is for the king of the chip realm. Numerous AI infrastructure solutions from NVIDIA are available for use in applications involving autonomous vehicles. Software developers can train neural networks to better comprehend a range of real-world driving conditions with its DGX platform. NVIDIA's Omniverse platform, which enables developers to construct intricate virtual worlds, and produce realistic driving-related simulations may then be used to stress test these models. This service is essential because it enables businesses to test and refine their autonomous car systems before using them in the real world. In its ecosystem for autonomous vehicles, NVIDIA already has a number of strategic alliances, including those with General Motors, Rivian Automotive, Toyota, BYD, Neuro, Lucid Group, Polestar, and NEO. Demand for a business that, in theory, shouldn't exist. Repairing cutting-edge NVIDIA chipsets that the U.S. has prohibited from exporting to its tech and trade rival has started to soar in China. Approximately a dozen specialized businesses already provide repair services. Two of these businesses in Shenzhen, a tech hotspot, claim that they primarily restore NVIDIA's H100 GPUs that have somehow found their way into the nation, along with A100 GPUs and a variety of other chips. The H100 was prohibited from sale in China prior to its debut in September 2022 by U.S. authorities who were eager to control Chinese technical advancements, especially those that may be used by its military. Its predecessor, the A100, was also banned at the same time after being on the market for over two years. There is extremely considerable repair demand, 
said a co-owner of a firm that has been fixing NVIDIA's gaming GPUs for 15 years and began working on AI processors in late 2024. Due to the success of the business, the founders established a new company to handle the orders, and it currently fixes up to 500 NVIDIA AI chips every month. According to social media advertisements, it has a room that can hold 256 servers and replicates the surroundings of customers' data centers for testing and repair validation. The idea that there has been a substantial amount of NVIDIA chipset smuggling into China is supported by the repair industry's explosive growth since late last year. The government and military have reportedly acquired the U.S. company's banned AI chips through tenders. Sense of both parties have proposed requiring chipsets to be tracked so that their location can be confirmed after they are sold. This is in response to the widespread smuggling of costly NVIDIA products into China. This week, the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump also supported the proposal. The flourishing repair sector also demonstrates how, even in the face of new, if less potent, goods from Chinese tech giant Huawei, NVIDIA's cutting-edge GPUs continue to be in high demand. Although it is legal in China to purchase, sell, and repair NVIDIA GPUs, the sources for this piece chose not to be named because they did not want to come under suspicion from Chinese or American authorities. In China, NVIDIA is legally prohibited from offering replacement or repair parts for products that are restricted. On the other hand, sources claim that NVIDIA usually fixes GPUs with flaws in other nations while they are still protected by the three-year guarantee. Only the corporation and its approved partners can offer the service and support that clients require, according to an NVIDIA representative. It is not feasible from a technical and financial standpoint to use restricted products without authorized hardware, software, and technical support. Sales of NVIDIA's H20 AI chipset, which was developed specifically for China to circumvent U.S. rules, have only lately been allowed to resume. However, adopting H20 chipsets isn't always a simple or smart decision for Chinese companies. One H20 server with eight GPUs inside would probably cost more than 1 million yuan, $139,400. According to industry sources, thus price is a problem. Although H20 chipsets, which have more memory bandwidth, were specifically designed for AI inference work, businesses that train large language models would likely prefer H100 chipsets, which are better suited for that purpose. Don't forget to share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. Your input helps create a more knowledgeable community where we can all learn and grow together in the world of investing. Stay up to date with the latest market trends, insights, and key updates by subscribing to Investing Tutorial. We're here to help you make smarter investment decisions and stay ahead of the curve. At some point, there needs to be uh, a couple red days to you know, keep us honest here. Now, doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be today. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be significant. But the market's not going to go up every single day into perpetuity. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about the seasonal effects and how this next three, four-month period is a little bit more choppy and sideways historically. So something to consider as we look at that. Uh, but month to date for July, it's hard to, you know, really be disappointed given the run-up that we've seen. Now, this chart we have on the screen is the uh, month to date trade, uh, you know, for the S&P 500. And you look at it, uh, you know, through yesterday, obviously a really nice day. And so all things considered, uh, looking at this, uh, Nicole, you know, this is a one standard deviation channel surrounding it basically showing that, you know, the move that you've had thus far uh, through this month is totally within a normal uh, condition based off that linear regression, which is that yellow line. So, you know, we want to, like, I think, put in perspective that this hasn't been, you know, this dramatic melt-up uh, bubble-like move in July. It's been methodical. It's been uh, well contained. It's just been a strong month, all things considered, uh, building on what's been a really, really strong start to the year, even after the huge drawdown in the first quarter.